Good morning. Welcome to Camarillo United Methodist Church. We are glad that you are joining us in worship uh, this morning over the internet. Today is the first Sunday of the month, and so we will be having Holy Communion uh, this morning. And so if you wish to observe communion with us, uh, we ask that you prepare a piece of bread and a drink of some sort, and just have them ready for that time in that, uh, that point of the service. At that time, I will then pray for God's grace to consecrate all of the, our elements together, and then we will partake of them together. Now, if, if you wish to abstain from communion uh, this morning, that's okay too. We just ask that you be in prayer with us uh, during that time as we all re remember Christ's presence with us. Now, as we begin our service this morning, I want to share with you some celebrations of ministry here at Cam Camarillo UMC. First of all, we want to congratulate Taylor Bin Binney and Chandler Lane for their wedding yesterday. Here's a wonderful picture. Yeah, well, it was a wonderful celebration yesterday, and so we, uh, we pray that uh, their lives be full of God's blessing and their home be filled with joy and peace. We also want to highlight some, some of the incredible work that's been happening uh, on campus here with volunteers that transformed uh, like the Friendship Garden. Over the past few weeks, uh, we had uh, volunteers come together and, and we ended up transforming what was just a plot of dirt to that beautiful venue for the wedding. It's amazing what we can do when we all come together and put our hands to work. But it's not just the garden, our youth group, our youth group spent a couple of days this past week working on the parking lot and the grounds. Uh, we actually, uh, if you actually come by this church, you will actually see the, the parking spaces now. So we want to give thanks for their hard work, and we also want to give thanks to Miss Christie for putting all that together. Now, with all these activities happening, I'm sure many of you are wondering, when are we going to be reopening church? When are we reopening the doors for worship? Well, our leaders have been meeting uh, together to plan carefully to make sure that the safety and the health of the congregation comes first. And so with that, we want to hear from you as well. We want to hear from you your thoughts and your feelings about participating in in-person worship. So there's going to be a survey. There's a survey that will be emailed out tomorrow. And so we ask that everyone ages 14 and over to fill out that survey, one per person. And if there is anyone that you know that do not have an email or internet access, uh, please let the church office know. Uh, we, need to, uh, we need to make sure that we get these surveys filled out by as many people as we can from our church so that we can get a, a, a better assessment of how to uh, move forward in preparing for in-person in -person worship. So again, thank you, and please check your emails tomorrow. One last announcement to make. This coming Saturday, uh, we have another wonderful event, and that is the uh, Family Fun Night, uh, this Saturday, August 8th, from 7 to 8.30. There will be games and activities. Again, it we will be socially distanced, and we will be wearing our masks, but it will be a wonderful evening uh, this coming Saturday. So just keep that in mind. Mark it on your calendars. With that, let us continue in our service. And again, we will be singing our, our hymn together. You can sing as loud as you want from home. We'll be singing from our Faith We Sing songbook, page 2202, Come Away With Me.
Our first scripture reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 14, verses 13 to 21. Hear the account of Jesus feeding the multitudes. Now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them as they cured their sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, this is a deserted place, and the hour is now late. Send the crowds away so that they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Jesus said to them, they need not go away. You give them something to eat. They replied, we have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. And he said, bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowds. And all ate and were filled. And they took up what was left over of the broken pieces, 12 baskets full. And those who ate were about 5,000 men besides women and children. Amen. Hi, Sunday School friends. I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about the story we just heard. And it's an important story. I know that because you can find it in four different books in the Bible. You can find the story in the book of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So I know it's important. It's a story that God wants us to know and he wants us to learn from. But before we talk about the story, I want to ask you a question. Did you ever take your lunch to school before? Did your mom or dad ever pack up a nice lunch and send it to school so that you could eat it at lunchtime? Do you think that lunch was enough to feed all the kids in your whole school? Or even all the kids in your class? What about all the kids in your class and the whole school and all the teachers and all the grown-ups that work there? Did you have enough food for that? Probably not. I know that when I pack a lunch for my daughter, it wouldn't be enough food to feed the whole school because I'm just a regular mom packing a regular lunch, but Jesus is not a regular person. Jesus can do miracles. And in this story, he does a miracle. Another thing about this story is there's a lot of numbers in it. I'm going to retell it to you, and I want you to listen for all the numbers you'll see. There's going to be the number 1, and the number 5, and the number 12, and the number 5,000, and the number 2. And every time you hear me say a number, I want you to say a rhyme with me. And the rhyme goes like this. 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4, 5,000 fed, and still there was more. So as you heard, Jesus wanted a quiet place to rest that day, but he didn't get it. He went to the sea, and his 12 friends went with him. 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4, 5,000 fed, and still there was more. But they weren't alone. Many people followed them. Many people wanted to be near Jesus. They had heard of the stories he told and the miracles he performed and the sick people he had healed. And that day, 5,000 people went to be near Jesus. That's a big number. Ready? 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4, 5,000 fed, and still there was more. He talked to the people. He taught them many things. He healed the sick people that were there that day. And people stayed with him all day long. And they didn't all bring food. They got hungry by dinner time. And Jesus asked the disciples about the food. Can you feed them? Do you think they had enough food to feed 5,000 people? They told Jesus only one boy brought food. One is a number. 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4, 5,000 fed, and still there was more. And he only brought two fish and five loaves of bread. 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4, 5,000 fed, and still there was more. Jesus said, bring the food to me. 
And when they did, he held it, and he looked up to heaven, and he thanked God for providing this food, and then he did a miracle. Because he broke the bread, and he broke the fish, and he handed it out to the people, and everybody had plenty of food to eat. The Bible tells us they were satisfied. That means their bellies were full. This was not a small snack that Jesus provided. He provided what they needed, and they all felt good after they ate. And after that, he told his 12 disciples, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4, 5,000 fed, and still there was more to please collect the food that was left over so that it wouldn't be wasted. And they collected 12 baskets of leftover food, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4, 5,000 fed, and still there was more. That's just one of the many miracles that we can read about in the New Testament. I look forward to doing a lesson with you soon when you can be here with me. We come to this time in our service as we uh, enter into a time of prayer. We lift up prayers for our congregation and the community around us. Please join me in bowing our heads and being in an attitude of prayer. Most gracious and loving God, we give you thanks as we gather once again as a church for worship in this online format. We give you thanks, O oh God, for the many gifts and the talents that you have provided through servants, such as our media team, who work diligently to, in making these worship productions happen. May you continue to guide us in creating ways to lead our congregation in worship each Sunday. Remind us that even in these times of quarantine, your spirit still leads us in being a church, joining us all together in the spirit and calling us to be a people of faith, spreading hope and joy in times of challenge. Be with us, O God, this day. As we come before you in worship, we give you thanks for the many joys that we experience. We celebrate with the Binney family as, uh, as we congratulate Taylor and Chandler's wedding yesterday. May their new life of marriage be blessed, providing them with wisdom and strength each day of their lives. May the home that they establish truly be a haven of your peace. We also give thanks for the many volunteers who've worked hard over the past month transforming our, 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 our church, especially our friendship garden, from a plot of dirt to a beautiful venue for the wedding. May it be a reminder for us that w of what is possible when we put our hands to work. We also give thanks for the amazing service of our youth, as they also spent the week striping our parking lot and learning the value of service. Thank you, O oh God, for the continuing opportunities to serve. In the midst of these celebrations, we are mindful of those in our congregation in need of special prayer. And so we lift up prayers for Reverend Terry Bouchard as, on the passing of his brother Larry and for the family of Maria Martel on her passing as well. May your peace be upon them as they cling to your hope of resurrection and eternal life. We also continue to lift up prayers for Janice Kooten, Donna Lutz, and Marlene Jones on the passing of their spouses. May you surround them with your strength and peace. We pray for Reverend Lee Truman as he prepares for surgery next week and for his son Nathan as he continues treatment for leukemia. We also pray for Ross Matarazzo's 
uh, aunt Patty, who has been diagnosed with the coronavirus, and for Kathy Asola's sister, Christine, for her breast cancer, and for Mary Dodge's grandson, Jasper, for his heart. May you work through the medical staff in providing care for each and every one of them. Lord, be with them. Grant them your strength, strength to overcome the ailments and the illnesses that they have. But more importantly, may your healing hands, may your healing presence be upon them in providing them with hope and strength. We also lift the prayers for Marlene Farwell and Mark Rogers and Anne Leffingwell's son, Michael, as they all continue their recovery from their medical procedures this past week. Again, may your spirit give them strength and find peace knowing that they are surrounded by the love and the prayers of this congregation. May they know, may we all know that we are not alone. Even in these times of the pandemic where we may be socially distanced and separated, we are still one, one church. And especially when we lift each other up in prayer, we are truly one body in Christ. Oh God, there are other prayers that we hold in our hearts. Hear them, oh God, as we lift them up to you in, at this time. In all these ways and more, we lift up our loved ones and our friends to your care. Strengthen each and every one of us as we strive to be your agents of hope and peace in this world. Continue to empower us that we may be witnesses of your love and your grace to all. We pray all this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ who has taught us all to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We take this time to give our offerings and tithes. We encourage you to either mail in your check to the church or give online on our church website. And if you have already set up automatic giving through your bank, we especially thank you for doing that as it maximizes your gift to the church without incurring additional fees. As there are many needs continuing in our community, we ask that you give generously to support the ministries of the church.
Our second scripture comes from the book of Genesis, chapter 32, verses 22 to 31. As Jacob decides to return to his home, he struggles with what he must face. Listen to the account of Jacob wrestling with God throughout the night. The same night, he got up and took his two wives, his two maids, and his eleven children, and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream, and likewise everything that he had. Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he struck him on the hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go for the day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then the man said, you shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with humans and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the place Peniel saying, for I have seen God face to face, and yet my life is preserved. The sun rose upon him as he passed Penuel, limping because of his hip. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Be God. Amen. Please join me in a word of prayer. A gracious, loving God, we give you thanks as we come together at this time to reflect upon the passages that we have heard. Lord, we ask that your Holy Spirit touch us in our hearts to open it and also to open up our minds and our ears to be receptive to what you have to say to us. We ask, O oh God, that the meditations of all of our hearts and the words of our mouths be acceptable in your sight for you are our rock and our redeemer. In Christ's most holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let me ask you a a couple questions as I begin. Have you ever faced a situation that you thought was utterly impossible, where you struggled with what to do? Perhaps within the, the past few, few months in dealing with the coronavirus, you know, whether it's trying to figure out how to stay healthy in the midst of all this, uh, in the midst of the pandemic, or maybe in trying to manage your finances during this very difficult time. Or maybe just trying to figure out this whole technology, and for many of you, it was the first time getting on Zoom and all. You know, have you had these times of wondering, 
how do we, what, what do we do? How do we go forward? Wondering how, how do we face these times of being impossible? Let me tell you a story. There's a man by the name of George Danzig. He's a mathem mathematical uh, professor out at Stanford University. When he was in grad school at UC Berkeley, during his first year, he went to one of his classes late. Now, we all know that this about not wanting to be late. Well, when he got into the class, he noticed that there were already things um, on the board. And um, he noticed that on the, on the chalkboard, there were two math problems. Now, he assumed that these were assignments that he, he, he needed to finish. So he quickly jotted them down and assumed that they were homework that he needed to finish. But these were not just regular problems. These were really hard problems. And he struggled with them all week long. In fact, he couldn't finish it in one night, so he kept, it, he kept on it for several days. And finally, at the end of the week, he went up to his professor, apologized for being late with his homework, and asked if he could still turn it in. To which the professor just kind of said, just throw it on my desk. Well, Danzig thought that he was really in trouble because the professor didn't really pay much attention to him. But what he didn't realize was that the problems that, um, that he so worked on, they were not homework problems. They were actually put on the board by the professor as examples of problems that were unsolvable. Even Einstein, Albert Einstein, couldn't solve them. But Danzig didn't know that. And he spent all week working on them. Suddenly, a few weeks later, on, on a morning, Sunday morning, in fact, there was a knock on his door at, at home. And it was the professor. And the professor was very excited. He, he finally um, looked at what Danzig had, had turned in and was there to tell him to go and get it published because he had just solved a problem no one could solve before just because no one told him that it was impossible. There's a lesson to be learned here, isn't it? Don't go around saying something can't be done. In our Bible passage today, the disciples thought that they had an impossible problem to solve. They, they were in a deserted place, you know, with over 5,000 men, you know, not including women and children. And so let's say there's about 15,000 people all together. And it was getting late. It was supper time. And so the disciples tell Jesus, Lord, you know, it's, it's time to stop preaching. Stop talking. Go send the people home so that they can get something to eat. You know, or at least stop by McDonald's or something. But then Jesus says to him, says to them, no, you go feed them. And all of them, all of them, they looked around, and all they, they had in front of them were just five loaves and two fish. I could sing the song again, right, that r little rhyme. No, I won't. Okay. I'm sure the disciples were struggling to figure out what Jesus was trying to say to them. In their minds, it was impossible. It can't be done. Charles Kettering uh, was a research head of General Motors, and he once said that when he wanted a difficult problem to be solved, before he would call a meeting with his staff, he would place a table outside of the boardroom with a sign that said, leave your calculators outside. And he did that because he noticed that when he didn't put out that sign, someone would inevitably always uh, end up taking out their calculator in the middle of the meeting, start punching the numbers, and say, boss, nope, 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 can't be done, can't be done. Have you ever heard those words yourself? Or even said it yourself, can't be done? I'm guessing, yes, especially to this congregation, because one of the things I've come to realize about Camarillo UMC is that we have uh, a, a church full of engineers in this congregation. And I'm sure there are some in this church who's quick to pull out that calculator and start crunching numbers first. Whenever something needs to be accomplished, I'm sure there is, there is someone who's always saying, that can't be done. You can't, 
lose that weight. You can't get that job. You can't make that marriage work. You can't really change. And because we listen to people who, who tell us, we can't, we can't, we can't, we give up even before we try. Rita Montassini is, a, is an Italian scientist who once wrote, I am convinced that in research, neither intelligence nor efficiency are what really counts. What counts is a tendency to underestimate difficulties. Because when you underest uh, underestimate difficulties, you're more apt to tackle problems other people would say cannot be solved. That's the truth. In fact, that's the truth in all aspects of life. When athletes win or, or, or advance themselves, it's because they have in their minds, they set their minds on winning, on winning thoughts. There's a story about Franklin Jacobs who set the, the world record back in 1978 by jumping seven feet, seven inches, well, seven and a quarter inches. That's pretty high. Seven feet, yeah, it's, it's up there somewhere. But what's more amazing with that feat was because he was only five feet, eight inches tall. That's actually about my height. So what he ended up doing was jumping essentially an additional 23 inches or almost two feet above his own height. Can you imagine that? Th that's, that's amazing. And in fact, it's still the world record for the highest differential in height that someone has jumped. When people asked him, how is it that a guy that's only five feet, eight inches tall can jump almost two feet above his head, he responds, I never thought of myself as being short. When I approach that bar, I think of myself as being, mm, maybe I'm six feet six. And so he sets his mind for higher standards. There are always folks who focus on what cannot be done or what cannot happen. The disciples of Jesus were focusing on their problems, not their possibilities. Jesus told them to give the crowd something to eat, and they said, we only have five loaves and two fish. Now, did Jesus ask them you know, what they had on hand? No. Did he ask them to go and go and open up a restaurant? No. Jesus knew that no task undertaken when it's God's command is going to be impossible. If God tells us to go out and feed a hungry world, well, not only with the physical bread, but also the bread of life, which is the word of God, is that impossible? Of course not. If Jesus tells us to, to make disciples of all nations, is that impossible? Of course not. If the Spirit of God fills this place and, and, and tells you know, all of us, each and every one of us in our hearts, tells us to figure out a way to still be church in the midst of this coronavirus pandemic, is that impossible? Of course not. There is no task that is impossible if it's according to God's command, God's will. Because God is the God of miracles. Yes, miracles. If God can take a pile of dirt and turn it into human beings, us, there is nothing that is impossible to God. Jesus took the five loaves and the two fish, looked up into heaven, gave thanks, blessed it, broke it, and then gave it to his disciples. And the disciples gave it to the multitudes. And they all ate. As Carrie wonderfully retold that story, they were all full. Every one of them, 5,000 men and an untold number of women and children. There's plenty, plenty to go around. There's plenty to eat. Impossible? Not at all. Somehow and by some way, it happened. Now, Matthew doesn't really get into explaining how it happened. But I know for engineers, we're always trying to figure out, yeah, how do you get that to work, right? How did that happen? 
We always want to know how something is going to get done. I don't know. Some people say it was a supernatural miracle. Others believe that it happened because all the people had some food with them, not just that one, one boy who had the five loaves and two fish. If he had it, come on. Other people would have had to have it as well, right? So then when that boy shared his food, then Jesus gave thanks, and he, everyone started sharing. If you think about it, it was the first Christian potluck. Very Methodist. Something we all miss, don't we? <laughs> yeah. We don't know exactly how it happened, and it, but it doesn't matter. What difference, what does matter, well, it doesn't matter what or how God made it to work, how it got it to happen. If God does a miraculous multiplying of the fish and uh, uh, loaves, great. If God wants to open up people's hearts and cause them to share, well, that's a miracle too. But the point is, everyone was fed. Everyone had plenty. And there were baskets full of leftovers. Our lesson in this is to trust God. Trust God because God can do all things. God can take a little and make it plenty. If God commands it, then God will take care of it. There's a story about a a new Christian believer who was walking through a park, reading the Bible, when he read the story about how Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt, and when they got to the Red Sea, Moses split the water in half uh, so that the Israelites could walk across the, the sea on dry land. You, you know that story, right? You have that image of Charleston Heston in your mind? Yeah, that, yeah, that story. So, he, so as soon as he read that in the Bible, this man got really excited upon reading this, and he started jumping up and down and praising God in open public. Well, seated at a bench nearby was a skeptic, and when he saw that this man was praising God, he went up to him and said, what are you so excited about? And when the man explained the passage, the skeptic replied, oh, I know that story, and I researched it thoroughly. The geography of where that the Israelites crossed was not really the Red Sea, but it was the Reed Sea, which is actually this tiny little stream with only two inches of water. It's a translation error. So the Israelites just kind of trampled over a small puddle, not some great sea. There's no such thing as miracles. Okay. So the man thanked him for clarifying the story and then continued walking. But a few steps later, he began jumping up and down again and praising God. So the skeptic went up to him again and said, Look, I told you, it was the Red Sea. Or it was the Reed Sea, not the Red Sea. It was just two inches of water. Why are you so excited? And the man said, Yes, and I thank you for explaining that to me. But I just read that after the Israelites walked over uh, the Reed Sea, uh, the the Egyptian soldiers came chasing after them, and they all drowned in that two inches of water. Get it? You see, no matter how we look at it, God is the God of miracles. God can do all things, and God provides for our needs. God can help us accomplish our hopes and our dreams. God can take our little and turn it into plenty. And so as followers of Jesus Christ, we need to take our hopes and place it in front of God and see what God can do with it. Do you have hopes to place before God? What are your hopes? What are your dreams? Maybe our hope is to finally get out of this pandemic or hope of being able to worship in person again. Yeah. Maybe we have hopes for our homes, for our jobs, for our financial welfare, or simply for our health. Whatever our hopes and dreams may be, let's place it before Jesus and see what God can do with it. Like Jacob in that Old Testament reading that we just heard, 
we've struggled long enough with our own limitations, with our doubts and our way, own way of doing things. Our human tendency is always to try to fix ourselves by ourselves. And we know that that doesn't work. What we learn from the story in Matthew as well as in Jacob's story is to turn our struggles and our hopes over to God. Because when we do so, miracles do happen. God has a way of, of always surprising us and blessing us beyond our imaginations. But it requires trusting. Trusting and being open to what God does. And so I, I invite our congregation, let's start dreaming together of what God has in store for our church. And then let's trust, God, trust in God's spirit to lead the way that we may be witnesses of God's amazing work in our lives and in this community around us. Thanks be to God. Amen. With that, I invite us to go over this to this table. And if you have your uh, bread and your uh, juice prepared, I invite you to um, join me in this time in remembering, remembering that very night in which Christ gave himself up for us. Every time we come to this table, it is a reminder. It is a reminder that Christ, in the midst of what he knew would happen the very next day, he knew that he would go to the cross. And yet he spent that very last night with his disciples. He gathered with them. He assured them. He made a promise to them that he will always be with them. And through it all, despite what struggles and trials may come, there will be victory. And with, because of that, we know, and every time we come to this table, by partaking of the, the bread and the juice, it is a reminder that there is victory, even in the face of death, persecution, struggle, hardship. And so let us remember at this time that on that very night, Jesus gathered with his disciples in that upper room, that we may be gathered in the different places, but Christ is still with us. In that gathering, Jesus took a piece of bread. He gave thanks to God, broke it, and then gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat, for this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks to God and then gave it to his disciples saying, drink from this, all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us all join together in prayer. O gracious and loving God, we pray that you will pour out your Holy Spirit on all of us gathered throughout wherever we are, in our homes, in our respective places. May your Holy Spirit be upon all of us as we gather before you. And we ask that you, your Holy Spirit, will pour out upon the gifts of the bread and cup that has been placed before us. Make them be for us the body and the blood of Jesus Christ, that when we partake of it, we may be the body of Christ, redeemed by your blood, to go out into the world. Even in this pandemic, through our lives, may we be a witness that we may continue to still be in ministry with you. Lord, may your spirit transform our lives, that through our lives, we may continue to serve and transform the world around us. We pray all this in your son's precious name. Amen. I invite you to take the piece of bread 
For this is the body of Christ. You may dip in the cup or drink of the drink and partake of it. Let us all partake of it together. May we always be reminded of who we are as disciples of Jesus and the body of Christ. Amen. conclude our service, <coughs> I was reminded uh, to not forget to thank uh, my wife uh, for <laughs> singing her solo th this morning. It was a way for uh, the congregation and everyone else to uh, get to see my wife. I know I've been talking about her for a few weeks and everyone's been asking, who is this mystery woman? I do have a wife and you saw her. Now receive the benediction. As we continue to live each day in the midst of a pandemic, in the midst of life's challenges, may we never lose hope, but place our trust in God. May we, may we lay before the feet of Jesus our hopes, our dreams, that in doing so, may the Spirit of God lead us into a future May we witness to what God does in our lives. Amen.